Breeden. Já jsem z New Yorku, ale tady bydlím dost dlouho a mluvím česky, ale mám ještě ten takový silný, ošklivý americký přízvuk. A jsem trošku líný, tak budu teď mluvit anglicky. So probably like everyone today, the opportunity to speak here gave me a chance to look back at my career and think what I had done well, what I had not done so well. I'm going to tell you today a story of what I didn't do so well for probably about 15 years until about five years ago. That might sound a little dramatic, but I'll give you the background. So I've been a journalist for about 25 years, and for the last 20 of those, I've been running an organization based here in Prague called Transitions. We publish an online magazine covering Central and Eastern Europe. We do a lot of journalism training and media literacy training. So about five years ago, I got invited to a workshop here in Prague, and I've been to a lot of workshops over the years, journalism workshops. Some good, some bad, some helpful, some really not helpful at all. So I was a little skeptical, but I was curious. That's why we become journalists, because we're curious people. So this workshop was organized by an organization called Ashoka. Maybe you've heard of it, International Network of Social Entrepreneurs. And the guest who was invited was named David Bornstein. He's a Canadian journalist, a writer, an expert on social innovation, and the co-founder, along with a woman named Tina Rosenberg, and another woman named Courtney Martin of an organization called the Solutions Journalism Network. And David had come to Prague to tell many of us how we weren't doing our job quite right. What he wanted to tell us, first of all, was we should be thinking much more about the impact of the journalism we do on our audience. I'd been covering Central and Eastern for a long time. We'd been writing about war, conflict, human rights violations, poverty, everything bad in the world. It didn't make me feel great, but I thought we were doing our job. That's what was out there. That's what was happening. Most people, though, have a different view of the news. I'm just curious maybe to ask all of you to start. What do you think when you read the news? What kind of feelings does it give you? What kind of mood do you have? Anyone want to yell anything out? Feel free. Depression, frustration, yeah. So these are things we hear all the time, but we don't talk enough about them. People who read the news today feel hopeless, very often powerless. They feel like they can't do anything in the world. It, it doesn't make them feel great. We call this news aversion. Sometimes it's called news fatigue as well. And those who yelled something out, you're far from alone. The Reuters Institute, which is based at Oxford, does a study each year about the state of the media. Last year, they did a study, and they asked people about their news consumption. 38% said they try to avoid the news. That's up from 29% about five years ago. This is a big problem. That was across 46 countries, so this is a problem internationally as well. You might wonder why people avoid the news, so they ask them. And I think a lot of us who talk a lot about disinformation and these issues, you might think it's because people don't believe the news, they don't trust it, and that's why they avoid it. That's an important reason, but one of the most important reasons is because it simply puts them in a bad mood. It wears them out. And of course, most of us are rational, and if something doesn't make us feel good, we don't like to do it. So a lot of people simply avoid the news. This is obviously not a good thing for society. It means people are tuning out from public life. They're not engaging. They don't want to be active in local community initiatives. They never turn on the news, they never look at a website. It's a big problem for any society, let alone a democracy. So one of the reasons that people really said they don't like to read the news is, as I said, around 33% of people said it puts them in a bad mood. 
So with all this evidence out there, why do we journalists still keep publishing negative news all the time? There are many reasons for that, and I'll talk about a few more a little bit later. But one of the main reasons is that we as journalists, in journalism school, when we work in the media, we learn that our role is to serve as a watchdog. We're supposed to uncover everything bad in the world, crime, corruption, ineffective politicians, with the hope that things will get better. Often they don't, and people feel even more depressed. So when David came to Prague about five years ago, he was telling us that we should be thinking about something called solutions journalism. In some areas of Europe and Scandinavia, this is also called constructive journalism. And it basically means that we should go from being only a watchdog to also being something like a guide dog for our readers, our viewers. We should be guiding them away from only what's bad to also what's good and what's working in the world. It doesn't mean people should stop doing investigative journalism or uncovering bad stuff. That's essential for the world to get better. But there's another step. We have to go beyond that. We have to try to write about and cover what's actually working in the world. There's a great thirst for this type of journalism. A recent study in the US found that 60% of people who were asked said they wanted more solutions-oriented coverage. They also wanted more people, more reporting on the people in their communities doing things that would improve society, that were already working. So solutions journalism, just to tell you a little bit more what it's about, because some people don't understand, some of them think this is happy news. These are stories about firemen saving kittens up in a tree and happy news and things like that. In fact, it's really rigorous, evidence-based reporting, but instead of uncovering things, you're investigating what's working. So every solutions journalism article, according to the Solutions Journalism Network and according to the criteria we follow has four elements to it. One is that it describes very well how the response is working so others can emulate it. Second, it's based on evidence and impact. These are not stories about what we hope will work someday, but these are stories about things which are actually working today to improve people's lives. Third, these stories include deeper insights What's the strategy around the solution, the philosophy, so that we can learn a bit better how it works and how it can really be adapted anywhere? And fourth, each of these stories mentions limitations. Again, this is not PR, it's not advocacy. Every solution, well, no solution is perfect. There are always ways to improve it. So just to give you an example, you've probably seen stories about bad schools, schools that aren't working, schools that have low graduation rates. Students don't like to study there. Teachers don't like to work there. It's just miserable. So many journalists would do that story and do that story over and over again until hopefully something's changed, whether it's in five years, 10 years, whenever. A solutions journalist, however, would take a look around and try to find a school that was doing something right in the same community. They'd go and visit, they'd talk to the principals, the students, they'd dig deep to figure out what was actually working in that school, and they would write about that. As you can imagine, if these stories are promoted, they come out, they can make real change. The idea is that solutions journalism also leaves, leads to greater civic involvement. So that people who hear about that good school, but their kids are going to that bad school, will think, why can't we do what they're doing? And they might start to push their school principal, who no longer has an excuse. We don't know how to do it. No one is doing it better. Because we've already read a story now about what's working well. And in fact, a lot of research has shown that people do become much more connected to an issue when they read an inspiring story instead of a depressing story. They want to share these stories. They want to get involved. They want to do something. 
They feel like they're, they're, they're not powerless any longer. They can make change happen. So with all that research out there, you might ask again, why is this not happening more often? There are definitely challenges to all of this. Negative news does pay. You might have heard the old journalism saying, if it bleeds, it leads. It's a very cynical way of looking at it, but it's been shown, you put negative words into a headline, people are more likely to click on it. This is for a lot of different reasons. One theory is that people will look and read negative news because it might help them save their family, save themselves, prevent them from doing something harmful. Another theory is obviously it's good business. People have figured out if you put a plane crash on the front page, people are always going to read that story. The problem is if we always put plane crashes on the front page, car accidents, things like that, people also tend to think that this is the norm. If they see it often enough, they will begin to think that this is the usual way of things. So what we all have to do is really push for more inspiring stories. It's something all of you can do. I'm sure you have your favorite news sites, your favorite media. Maybe they're already doing some of this, but chances are they're not doing enough. So you need to really demand more. Those stories which are inspiring, try to click on those. Share those with people you know. Get discussions about it going. Most of the media are in it to be a good business. They care about what their readers think. So enough of you complain about it, they'll probably start to make changes for the good. And for those journalists, if there are any in the audience or any aspiring journalists, our hope is that you too will try to make a difference in your own media organizations. So the next time someone in the editorial office says, let's do that problem story yet again. Nothing's changed. Yes, everyone knows about the problem, but we have to do that again. That's our role. We're the watchdog. We have to keep uncovering all the bad stuff, even if people already know it. So my hope is that maybe you will be the one to raise your hand and say, this time, we should maybe do it differently. Let's focus on some change maker, change maker, some problem solver, someone who's trying to make the situation better, instead of recycling the old problem story yet again. That hopefully you'll be the one who can really make a change in your newsroom and get people to think more about solutions and what is making the world better, what can inspire people, what can make people emulate and adapt different solutions or effective responses to their own villages, towns, cities. There's so much out there to learn from, to build upon. It's a huge problem if we don't hear about all the good stuff that's out there, the things that are actually working to improve people's lives. And I would say as journalists, at least, we really owe it to our readers, our viewers, to not give them only part of the story, but give them the whole story, to not just depress them, but to also inspire them. Thank you.